Welcome to 2819. This is the show where we aim to inspire you to go and make disciples of all nations. I'm Sandra Dimez. And I'm Brian Rollenbacher, and this is a television outreach of Reasons to Believe, a viewer-supported ministry where science and faith converge. And you know, as you're watching the show, if you want to support resources like this show, visit reasons.org 2819. And for those of you watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button below. We want to make sure that you get up to date on all the new videos RTB is putting out. Also, you're going to want to stay up to date with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at 2819 Show. And don't forget the podcast version of 2019 is available on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. Just search Reasons to Believe Podcasts. You know, for many Christians, 2019 might be the year that we want to start and have a focused effort to share our faith more often throughout the year. That's right. And one of the ways you can do that is by attending AMP Conference 2019. It's taking place March 8th and 9th at EV Free Fullerton, California. And you know, once AMP is over, there's something immediately after the conference that you can register to attend and something called Continue the Conversation. That's right. You'll get a chance to connect with RTB staff, with different people attending the conference, and most of all, the different AMP speakers, including some of the RTB scholars. Yes, and it's a great opportunity to meet others who are really also interested in sharing their faith. And most importantly, there's going to be food and snacks and all kinds of glorious stuff to fill your bellies. Snacks! <laughs> Visit ampconference.com to register for AMP and also to register for Continue the Conversation. We'll both be there, yep. so we hope to see you at the conference. Now it's time for a quick rundown. In our Nexus segment, Dr. Hugh Ross will address the question, how can we share our faith with scientists? In RTB 101, Fuzz will be talking with Ken Samples, answering the question, what is the difference between evidential and presuppositional apologetics? Good words. There you go. In our give and take segment, Jeff will talk with Dr. Fazal Rana about the question, is language evidence of creation? And in Culture Talk, Sandra will be talking to Fuzz Rana about something very interesting, and that's Ancestry DNA Test. Now, I took one of those and I had all kinds of questions afterwards, <laughs> but you two are going to be focusing on what do we do when Neanderthal DNA shows up as their results. Yes. Let's check that out. Welcome to Culture Talk. This is the segment where we talk about the intersection of science, faith, and pop culture, and how culturally relevant topics can be used to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined with Dr. Fazal Rana, biochemist. Hey, Sandra. An awesome guy. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. You know, we're going to talk about something that's super popular right now, Ancestry DNA tests. Mm -hmm. So first of all, have you done one? No, I haven't done one. Uh, I, I'm a little... You're skeptical? Uh, yeah, that <laughs> how, uh, in terms of how reliable those tests are. Well, let's dive into first like the science behind these tests because yeah. that will help us look into the conversation a little bit. Well, more. you know, people hear the term DNA testing mm -hmm. and I think they're confused by exactly what that means because actually people may not realize this, but there's a number of different types of DNA testing that you can do. So there's medical DNA testing mm -hmm. that tells you whether or not you have a certain genetic propensity for a disease. There's forensics DNA testing, what's done at crime scenes. Right. And then something like what companies like 23andMe or Ancestry.com do, which is called genealogical ancestry DNA testing. Mm -hmm. And there the idea is to try to determine what geographical region of the world you originate from. Right. And the way that's done is by looking at certain genetic markers in your genome and comparing them to a reference database of people who uh, are from different parts of the world and based on the percentage matches, trying to estimate where you came from and maybe even estimate ethnic, uh, your ethnic makeup. Mm -hmm. Well, you're talking about where people came from, and that leads me to the next question of, you know, some of us get Neanderthal DNA as part of our results. So what does that mean? Yeah, well, I'm actually not surprised. And mm -hmm. in fact, I could tell you without any DNA testing whether or not <laughs> somebody has Neanderthal DNA. If you are from Europe or from Asia or from the Americas, uh, you most certainly have Neanderthal DNA in your genetic makeup. And in fact, if you're from Asian origin, you might even have a little bit of a genetic contribution from these highly enigmatic creatures called Denisovans. Mm -hmm. And this is because people believe that when humans began to migrate around the world, we interacted with Neanderthals and Denisovans and through that process interbred with them, introducing 
what it is now low levels of DNA from these hominids into our genome. But you really don't need DNA testing to know whether or not you have Neanderthal or Denisovan DNA. Well, it's really interesting because when we think about having Neanderthal DNA as Christians, we might say, well, wait a minute, what does that mean about us be, being created in God's image? So how would we look at that from a Christian perspective? Yeah, well, that's a, a really tricky question. It's mm -hmm. a very messy topic, the idea of humans interbreeding with Neanderthals. And I meet a lot of people who see this as a real serious challenge to the biblical account of human origins. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's a number of ways in which you can handle this. It's a complex scientific, you know, and theological and biblical issue. And in fact, we spend a whole chapter in my book, Who Was Adam, kind of unpacking that question. But the bottom line is, I don't necessarily see this as a faith challenge, uh, though it's, again, messy, because there's, there's an interesting passage in Genesis 6 mm -hmm. where it talks about the sons of God uh, basically interbreeding with hum human beings and uh, producing the Nephilim. And so this is an example of an interbreeding event that's part of our early history as human beings according to scripture. And you wonder if there is perhaps some connection between what's being described there in Genesis 6 and what we're now discovering as interbreeding events. So I'm, I'm glad that you point that out because we think as Christians, we look at the scientific data and you know we, we might wanna challenge it or just outright accept it but we also need to go and look at scripture and see whether or not that fits. So then you're saying that we see it in the scientific data and then also in the Bible as well. So that's that's good. It's a comfort to hear. A lot of times though that people would view would view that as something that would oppose Christianity, looking yeah. at Neanderthal DNA. Um, so you, you had mentioned earlier about the reliability of these tests. Like, are they even reliable? I think in a broad sense, they are reliable. Uh, I've heard stories of people submitting uh, DNA samples to two different companies and getting different results. Oh, wow. You know, and, and a lot of it has to do with what is the reference database that they're using. Mm. There's a possibility of human error in these analyses. So broadly speaking, they probably are reliable. But, you know, I don't know that I would get, go overboard in terms of looking at those results as somehow being definitive about who I, I am. Right. Well, you know, and that's something that we think of a lot, especially in our desire to want to do these DNA tests, is we think about our identity and we think about mm -hmm. who we are. And that's only part of the equation, but but we're more than just the DNA tests, right? That's right. You know, and there's a, a, a an idea that permeates our culture today mm -hmm. that you might call genetic fatalism or mm -hmm. genetic determinism, where we believe that we're the sum total of our genes. Mm -hmm. And so we are so attracted to these DNA tests because as you said, we wanna know where we come from, which with the idea that this shapes who we are. Mm -hmm. Our DNA tells us who we are now and, and what is our destiny going to be. Well, the fact of the matter is even biologically speaking, it's not just DNA that determines who we are. There, the environment plays a big role. Mm -hmm. Our experiences play a big role. Uh, and so our DNA isn't our destiny, uh, if you will. And the fact of the matter is Christians, we argue that really what defines us is an immaterial essence, basically our spirit or our soul. Mm. And, you know, the good news is that, you know, through the work of Christ on the cross and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, our destiny is shaped to who we are supposed to be through the work of uh, our Savior and the Holy Spirit. That's such a comfort for us to just remind us of our true identity and really our identity is in Christ. And these DNA tests are fun, but we're more than just that. So now I have my final question. How can we use the DNA tests as we talk about them with friends and stuff? How can we use that as an opportunity to share our faith? Well, you know, the same methods that are used for DNA testing of this sort, at least, are the same methods that anthropologists use to try to characterize the origin of humanity and the early migration of humanity. And what's provocative is those studies indicate that all human beings come from a mitochondrial Eve and all men come from a Y chromosome Adam that many people think correspond to single female and male individuals. And you have to wonder if these are pointers to the biblical Adam and the biblical right. Eve. So th th this, this DNA testing is a great chance just simply to talk about some really uh, spiritually profound issues. Who are we really? What really determines who we are? And where do we really come from? 
And you know, the answer matches in a large measure to the biblical account of human origins. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much mm -hmm. for that, Fuzz. And you know, you're talking about human origins. I just want to point out that you're going to have this DVD coming out from Opposition to Opportunity. So this, if you want to hear more from Fuzz, I would say visit reasons.org slash 2819. You can get this DVD as a gift for any donation in the months of January and February. And you can learn more about human origins through this video. Next up, we're going to hear from Dr. Hugh Ross as he answers the question, how can we share our faith with scientists? Let's check it out. When you talk with individuals in the scientific community, do you find that sometimes these kinds of um, approaches get more resistant? Because what you're doing is you're actually questioning their presuppositions upon which they've built their career. Well, what you'll see in the book is when you meet a stranger, ask questions. You need to find something out about them. And so like, for example, if uh, they're a professor at a university and they got tenure, and uh, find out what the research interests are. Mm -hmm. I like to engage academics with something that's academic that's not exactly right in their discipline. Okay. I mean, I can engage them on their discipline, uh, but I'll say, you know, have you heard about this? So I'll try to pick something that they're not familiar with uh, but present it at a high academic level, which they will appreciate and say, you know, I've never really considered that. Basically, I'm making the point, we need to integrate across the book of nature. Mm -hmm. And the problem with research science these days, it's hyper-specialized. Yes, it is. And because it's so hyper-specialized, people can't see the forest because of the trees. Right. So my job as an apologist and an evangelist is to help them see the forest. So I'll take them a little bit outside their discipline, not too far out, but enough where I'm not threatening their research, okay. but I'm giving them something else to consider that could actually affect how they think about the research. And you know, just realize, hey, there's much more to uh, reckon with here. And I also try to uh, you know, encourage uh, this academics, you need to spend a little bit of your time uh, focusing on the most important issues of life. And science can be so captivating that you never do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just talk about something a little bit outside their discipline. That's so like uh, if I'm talking to a medical doctor, I might engage in about cosmology. I'm talking to a cosmologist, I might talk to them about the latest research on uh, birds and uh, mammals. Uh, or I might talk to them about geophysics instead of astrophysics. You know, that's very interesting what you're studying. And what I try to do is talk to them about the research and find an additional piece mm -hmm. of research that actually uh, might be of interest to them. But most of the people I engage are not academics, uh, but they're interested. I mean, the thing that impresses me about the Bible, it commands everyone who's a serious follower of Jesus Christ to be a scientist. Mm. We're all to study God's book of nature. But I also make the point and always be ready. In many respects, those of us in the 21st century are more ignorant about nature That's than true. people that 4,000 years ago. We don't get to see stars yeah. like people did yeah. in the days of uh, Job. And we, don't, we definitely don't study their movements and uh, we and don't have intimate contact with yeah. wild birds and mammals yeah. like they did back then. And you know, one of the books I wrote was Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, where I said, God designed these wild birds and mammals to teach us significant spiritual lessons. And people 4,000 years ago saw those lessons. Yeah. People working in high-tech research labs don't. Yeah. You had mentioned in the book also that um, some of your most fruitful discussions on spiritual issues with scientists were when you would take them out into nature. Right. And uh, the argument from beauty is something that I've always been interested in because, because it is truly outside of both the scientific realm in, in some aspects and, and most kind of well-trodden arguments that atheists are against. but. But the idea that there is this beauty that a sunset can't be just, you know, reduced to um, wavelengths of light or something. Well, I'll like ask that. some questions like, you know, okay, why is the scene that we're enjoying here in these alpine meadows so beautiful? Can you explain yeah. to me why it's so scenically beautiful? Or can you explain to me why we humans happen to be living at the most scenically beautiful time in the history of Earth? Is there an explanation for that? 
or why are the right answers in uh, physics always the ones described by the most elegant and beautiful equations? Mm. Yes. Explain to me why equations of mathematics are so beautiful and elegant. Right. And so the beauty principle, and it's everywhere. And so what does that tell us about the author of creation? If you'd like to find out more about our friend Lenny Esposito and his ministry, go check out his website at comereason.org. And now it's time for RTB 101. This is the segment where we talk about practical questions to help train you to share your faith with friends and family more effectively. And I'm here once again with theologian and philosopher Kenneth Samples. Hello. Welcome, Ken. Hi. You know, we talk a lot at the ministry about evidence. We, yes. we work in a realm with scientists where the word evidence and data is a big part of our vocabulary here. But Christians don't always agree about the best way to make the case right. for Christianity. So I thought it might be helpful to talk about kind of the two major approaches. So let's start with what we do here at the ministry, kind of the evidence-based approach. Yeah, there are different schools, as you mentioned, different methodologies of defending the faith. I think the RTB approach has more of an evidentialist focus than it does others. Um, it, it might go back and forth in particular areas, but evidentialism uh, looks at evidence. It starts with evidence. It says that a, a belief such as the Christian worldview is justified on the basis of evidence. And uh, so it believes that both Christians and non-Christians have common ground. They can reason when it comes to evidence for the faith, cosmological evidence, biological, historical, evidence for God's existence, evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. So since all of God has given all of us a mind, the, yeah. the kind of the idea is that th he has left his fingerprints in creation. There's evidence or data of his existence and even unbelievers, even in their fallen state, yeah. can look at that evidence and begin to glean some information yeah. about the Creator. Yeah, common ground. The okay. common ground would be that evidentiary basis. Maybe we'll argue that our view has greater evidence or more probable than the counter, but what RTB does is largely an evidentiary approach. Okay. Now, when I was in seminary, that was really the only view yeah. I had heard. Sure. And it wasn't until later that I got introduced to uh, what's called a presuppositional approach to defending the faith. Right. So walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think, again, a good way to think about presuppositionalism and even contrast it with evidentialism is the idea of a starting point. The presuppositionalists, rather than starting with evidence, are going to start with assumptions, that everybody brings certain assumptions to the table. But the presuppositionalist is going to argue that only if you begin with the triune God and Scripture as the Word of God, if you don't have that starting place, your assumptions are going to be faulty. And so you can't deal with evidence until you first deal with the assumptions of your starting place. Okay. Now, in this view, they're a little more skeptical of the non-Christian's ability to, to weigh out the evidence. That's a critical point. Uh, the non-Christian in the mind of a presuppositionalist has been affected by sin, and they're bringing faulty assumptions to the table, and it's only the Christian worldview and that assumption that allows for rationality, morality, etc. So there, there's a, a heavy emphasis on getting the right starting point. Okay, so they're more kind of at the ground level, the assumption level. Yeah. We got to debate our assumptions, whereas the evidential approach is more kind of up here. We're looking at the data and the... And more common the, ground uh, to, okay. to start with, yes. So I'm imagining that each of these has their strengths and weaknesses, yes. and especially when we're talking to non-Christians. Give us a couple snapshots of that, how to think about that. Yeah, I, I certainly think the evidentiary approach is a, a powerful approach because you're getting right to the issue of, is there evidence to support and justify my perspective? Uh, a, a weakness, of course, is that everybody has to interpret the evidence, and everybody's coming from a distinctive point of view. Or their assumptions. Or their assumptions. Okay. From a presuppositionalist point, I think one of the strengths is that nobody's neutral. Everybody begins at a particular place. Everybody's affected by sin. 
I think a weakness, however, is that a lot of times presuppositionalists don't get around to marshalling evidence. Uh, or they... You're so busy debating the assumptions. That's exactly right. Okay. So tell me, is there real evidence at some point? I think it's interesting, too, that oftentimes presuppositionalists tend to fall in the young earth creationist camp. So sometimes you see differing points of view reflected in methodology. Now, we said at the beginning of the segment that we tend to use more of the evidential approach here at Reasons to Believe. Does that mean we never use the presuppositional approach? That, that would be incorrect. We certainly, uh, I think we actually, while we're dominant toward an evidentialist approach, we use presuppositional ideas. Sometimes we appeal to what's called classical apologetics. I'm fond of a cumulative case. So I think at RTB you see a diversity of apologetic approaches. Very good. So when we're out there talking to non-Christians, sometimes we want to bring forth that evidence, but when there's obstacles in the way, sometimes it's useful to look at the assumptions yeah. and the, to switch to a more presuppositional strategy. And Krista, I think the, the approaches to apologetics, they have a lot more in common than they do different. So I am comfortable with people holding different points of view and making adjustments based upon the person they're talking to. Very good advice. And I want to encourage you to check out Ken's blog, Reflections. He actually did a blog post about presuppositional apologetics that you might want to check out. Now let's go over to Jeff, who is talking to Fuzz about the question, is language evidence of creation? Let's check it out. Hello and welcome again to Give and Take. This is the segment of our show where we look at fascinating and intriguing scientific discoveries and how they help us be more confident in the truth of Christianity so that we can go share it with others. Today I'm joined again by my good colleague and friend Fuzz Rana and we're going to investigate this question. Can evolution explain the origin of language? Fuzz? Good to have you here once again. Thank you, Jeff. So this is something that doesn't seem so remarkable. I mean, lots of different animals communicate. I mean, dolphins, whales, all sorts of animals communicate with each other. What's so important about human communication? Yeah, well, when human beings communicate through language, what we're doing is something fundamentally different than what animals are doing when they communicate. Animals are, in a sense, signaling to one another and the, what they're signaling is really very limited to just a, 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 a pre-described set of information or, or, or signals. But when it's, he, Okay, so we're both communicating information or exchanging information, but you're claiming the nature of the information right. we exchange is going to be different. Right. Okay. What we're doing is we're communicating open-ended information. So we're communicating using symbols. So it, we're representing the world with symbols. We're representing abstract ideas with symbols. And then we're combining and recombining those symbols in a variety of different ways to communicate information back and forth. Uh, much of what we're communicating is actually abstract in nature. It's not about the brute reality of the world around us. It's, it's really okay. an interpretation of the world. Okay, so, so the difference, uh, you know, trying to just kind of encapsulate that in an easy way to remember, is that when animals are communicating the dolphins, they're kind of signaling, hey, there's danger here, oh, I may like you, or mm -hmm. oh, you're a friend, something like that. Whereas when humans are communicating, they're communicating a depth or things where you and I have to be able to right. interpret things beyond just the actual words that were being said or the signals that were being right. Is and, that correct? Yes, and, and what animals are communicating, again, is a, is a, is a set of, of, of information. Mm -hmm. It's a closed set, whereas what we're communicating as human beings is an open set. It's open-ended, uh, that there's no constraints whatsoever on the information that we're communicating. So it's a, it's a fundamentally different mode of exchanging information. So in, in essence, we could, you know, if I draw an analogy there, is that there's a certain set of signals that an animal will use to communicate, and, and it's a finite set that communicates a finite set of ideas, but we're using, you know, just take the English language, 26 letters, and there's virtually no limit to how you could combine those letters into more and more words that might mean something and multiple things. So is that like what you're getting at with the open and closed nature of the yeah, communication? Yeah, or a, another way to think about it is think of, about coming up to a stoplight. Uh, and there's red, green, or yellow, which means stop, uh, 
slow down or speed up, depending on where you live, <laughs> right. uh, and, and green, which means to go. That's all the information that you can communicate with a stoplight. Okay. And that's what animal communication is okay. like. Right. Whereas humans are communicating in a way like the signage that you would see on billboards mm -hmm. where that, you know, the, the information that's communicated through billboards or through signs is limitless. Right. You're not okay. constrained to just three modes of information. So that's the, the difference between what humans are doing and what animals are doing. Okay, that makes more sense. So let's let's now dig in and explore why is this a problem or what sort of problems does this pose for evolutionary explanations? Well, for, for evolution to explain the origin of language, you have to go from animal signaling to open-ended communication of information. And evolutionary biologists have tried to explain how that kind of evolutionary transformation would take place and they simply can't do that. Uh, for example, uh, uh, a linguist by the name of Chris Knight, who's at the University College of London, basically points out that it's really interesting that language only seems to have emerged a single time, and that's with human beings. Mm -hmm. and, and so he argues the fact that you only see language emerging month, once means there must be some kind of impediment to the evolutionary origin of language. It must be very difficult to do. Now he's viewing this, of course, in evolutionary mm -hmm. terms. So, so th this is something that actually points to human exceptionalism, if you will, then our ability, how we communicate really does make humans exceptional. That's right, creatures. that's okay. right. Because again, we're the only creatures that, that possess this quality called language. And you could think of language as, as essentially a, a manifestation of what we would call the image of God. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that no matter how anthropologists and linguists try to explain the origin of language, they wind up in dead ends to the mm -hmm. point where uh, people have referred to the origin of language as Darwin's problem. We just don't know how language could emerge in evolutionary terms. And what's interesting is that when language appears, it appears suddenly mm -hmm. uh, and it's uniquely associated with modern humans. No other creature seems to possess language, including, uh, including Neanderthals. So, so let's kind of take a look at that. Uh, you know, it seems like uh, from a materialist scientific perspective, if you will, where you're only considering the material of the world, this is a problem to explain. How does a Christian think about this? I mean, why does this fit better within a Christian worldview? Well, you know, again, I would see language as part of, and parcel of the image of God. It's it defines us as human beings. It's, I think, a manifestation of, of the image of God that we possess. And the fact that, first of all, it seems to be unique to humans, the fact that we can't seem to explain how it could emerge through evolutionary means, and the fact that it seems to show up suddenly, to me, has the, the hallmark or the fingerprint of a creation event. And so when Scripture describes human beings as being created in God's image uniquely, what would it look like if that was the case? Well, it would look like all of a sudden with human beings is this, this set of properties that separate us from other creatures. And this is what we're beginning to see uh, when it comes to the origin of language. You know, I just, I just find that fascinating. Uh, not surprising at, at this point, but fascinating that the way the Bible describes things matches what we're finding scientifically mm -hmm. as we look in mm -hmm. at some things that could be very different, but yet yeah. they line up with the way the scripture describes them. Yeah. You know, Fuzz, thank you for your comments. I appreciate that. You know, language is one of those things that really does distinguish us from all the other creatures. You know, in fact, biblically speaking, you know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That language just seems inherent to who we are. It's part of our nature. And it reflects well that we're made in the image of God. And when we look at how does language arise from a natural scenario without inv invoking some sort of deity, a god, if you will, we find that evolution really has great problems explaining the origin of language. I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and look at Fuzz's blog, Can Evolution Explain the Origin of Language, to get equipped to understand the conundrums from an evolutionary perspective, but how this discovery points to a god who loves us and created us and desires for us to know him. That does it for us this week on 2819. We hope that you've been encouraged by the segments today to really just step out and share your faith with confidence and compassion. And if you want to support resources like this show, please visit reasons.org 2819. And don't forget to connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at 2819show. 
See you next time and hope to see you at AMP Conference. Bye.